Okay. Is the mic on? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll kick off, I think. Um, okay, hello everybody. I'm David Lee, and I've got the job of being last, which means you're all completely exhausted or sunburned or something, and probably, probably don't want me to go on too long. So I'll try not to be too lengthy, and I'll try not to be too boring. Um, and if I am too boring, please sleep quietly. Um, I'm a journalist uh, from England, but I'm basically a civilian, really, in the world of offshore. You're all experts, and I'm not. I run investigations uh, at The Guardian uh, into crime, bribery, that kind of thing. Um, and I didn't really know a whole lot about offshore until a few years ago when I was in the middle of a, a lengthy investigation into a giant arms company, uh, BAE Systems. They're the biggest arms company in Britain, one of the biggest in Europe, a very big player in America. And uh, they got where they are today, amongst other things, by paying very large sums of money to people to get arms contracts across the world. And at one point in this investigation, I found myself sitting in Ireland eating oysters with one of their confidential agents, um, who produced to me for the very first time something which is like gold dust if you're a, <coughs> a journalist. It was some Swiss bank accounts. And what they showed was that BAE had been paying money to this person, and indeed, as it transpired, to all their agents around the world, um, via a couple of BVI companies. One was called Red Diamond and one was called Poseidon Trading. And the funny thing was, when I went back and looked up the company records for BAE, there was absolutely no mention of the existence of either of these two subsidiaries, even though British company law requires it. Uh, and it turned out that they had simply calculated correctly that nobody policed British company law and they could get away with not declaring them. And because the BVI was such a successful secrecy jurisdiction, uh, they could use these two companies um, to funnel hundreds of millions of pounds, about a billion dollars in total was eventually identified, going to middlemen and then all over the world. <coughs> and what we're talking about here isn't some two-bit fly-by-night fraudsters. We're talking about a huge international company with an important corporate reputation, um, somebody who you would imagine would be extremely respectable. So that was my first introduction to the world of BVI secrecy. What has happened since then, uh, and which I found particularly interesting, is that the world of offshore secrecy, particularly in the BVI, has now taken a big blow. And I've been involved quite centrally in a pretty pioneering journalistic enterprise uh, which has gone some way towards stripping away the secrecy which is the stock in trade of many of these offshore centers, particularly the ones that are British dominated or British controlled. And therefore, my theme uh, this afternoon is that the offshore secrecy, which is that stock in trade, can no longer be guaranteed there may be people here who will disagree with me, uh, and it may be that I'm being overambitious in saying that, uh, but certainly at the moment I think it would be a very foolishly optimistic person who thought that <coughs> the walls of secrecy remained in place around places like the BVI. And the reason is quite simple. Since big data came into existence, since huge databases came into existence, which has been <coughs> the result of unstoppable technological developments, um, that data is going to leak. Once it becomes in existence, it's bound to leak. Once it leaks, this kind of data, very slippery, at the click of a mouse, it can be circulated around the world, it can fall into the hands of the wrong people, and the wrong people as far as many offshore operators are concerned, 
art journalist like me. Um, let me take you back a couple of years. Um, just this is where we got to a month or so ago. We were in a position where we, and when I say we, I mean the Guardian newspaper and our international colleagues in the ICIJ, which I'll talk about a, a little bit, um, were able to publish pretty well simultaneously the names of the people behind the companies, the names of the people hiding their wealth. Um, and this is what I think is the crucial achievement <coughs> which will damage, if not destroy, the concept of offshore secrecy. Now, back that couple of years to July 2010. This is really how it all started. WikiLeaks, I'm sure all of you recall the international furore about WikiLeaks. That's Julian Assange, uh, behind, who was behind WikiLeaks, holding up a copy of The Guardian when we ran the first phase of a worldwide coordinated simultaneous publication of a massive data leak. In that case, the leak was of US government information. It came from a soldier, a private soldier, Bradley Manning, who was stuck out in Iraq and who, <coughs> thanks to the existence of huge databases and thanks to the existence of some very poor security, was able to get his hands on uh, thousands of files of war incidents from Iraq and from Afghanistan, a video of uh, an Apache helicopter shooting up some civilians who turned out to be Reuters employees in Baghdad, and most sensationally of all, thousands of US State Department uh, classified diplomatic cables from all over the world. Bradley Manning, who is currently awaiting court martial and will probably spend much of the rest of his life in jail as a result, turn this stuff over to Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. Um, and he could do it so easily. That was the astonishing thing. He was able to upload from uh, a tent in the desert of, uh, in Iraq all this stuff to somebody like Assange, who then struck a deal with The Guardian in London, the um, New York Times, and um, Spiegel magazine in Germany, later to be joined by um, Le Monde in France and El Pais in Spain. And we all simultaneously published a lot. We published stories that revealed um, things the US government would much rather we had not revealed. Um, that's the classic example, and it's going to be referred to from now on in the history of these things, uh, of big data leaks. Um, but you will see that I put a note there of the size of the data package. It was 1.65 gigabytes, which we thought at the time was a hell of a lot. Um, it was a data that was relatively rigidly structured as well because the US military and the US State Department are very tightly organized about the way they lay out their documents and their rigid instructions. <coughs> you, you put this in this field, you put the embassy it comes from in that field, you put the level of classification in another. So, although it was hard work, it turned out to be relatively easy to uh, build a database in turn that we could interrogate the data and we could make it public. Um, there were other aspects of the WikiLeaks saga um, about the, the, the quarrels that were involved, which are irrelevant to my theme um, today. W what I want to focus on is the fact that when you invent big databases, they leak, and this was the first one. Um, spin forward a year or so. I'm sorry this is such an out of focus um, slide, but you can read the one key word, which is journalism. Um, this is the Global Journalism Conference in Kiev in October 2011. This was a group of investigative journalists who got together. <coughs> we have these conferences pretty regularly. They're like the offshore alert conferences, really, uh, in different parts of the world. I was at that conference, and there um, I met this guy, Gerard Ryle. Gerard is an Australian journalist. 
He um, used to be deputy editor of the Canberra Times, I think. Uh, he had a long and uh, important career with, with the Fairfax Organization in Australia. He then moved to Washington and became director of the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, now, what is that? It's a little non-profit, basically. Um, it's, it goes back about a decade. It was originally set up by a campaigning journalist called Chuck Lewis, who used to be a producer on, on 60 Minutes, uh, who launched something called the Center for Public Integrity in Washington. And this was an offshoot of it, the ICIJ. And what he did was he recruited a network of investigative journalists all over the world uh, who since then have engaged in cross-border projects. So we're trying to catch up. We're trying to catch up with global firms of accountants. We're trying to catch up with global uh, industries. Uh, we're trying to go global as well and with some success. Gerard, when he arrived from Australia in Washington, brought with him his dowry. And his dowry was a hard drive. And it contained um, <coughs> a lot of amazing material. Um, what it in fact had on his little hard drive was not 1.65 gigabytes, but 200 gigabytes of wildly unstructured material. It was the internal files from incorporation agencies, offshore incorporation agencies, working in a number of key offshore centers, um, places like the Cook Islands, places very much like the BVI, Singapore as well. Um, why it was unstructured was because it simply didn't contain the company files, the database of who and what. It also contained um, among its two and a half million documents, more than a million emails uh, to and from customers and intermediaries. Uh, it contained uh, things like scanned copies of passports. Um, it contained internal memos in obsolete formats going back 10, 15 years. Uh, a huge mountain of data which contained the internal dealings of offshore companies and these offshore, uh, offshore incorporation companies. And these are organizations whose stock in trade is secrecy. What they sell is secrecy. You know it better than me, I should think. And um, the BVI in particular has sold secrecy very successfully, I think since they launched themselves around 1984. They've now incorporated more than one million companies and entities, I should say. And I was pleased to see that people have now stopped talking exclusively about places like that as tax havens. They're not. They're, se they're secrecy jurisdictions. That's what they sell. Um, so, Gerard arrived with his hard drive with this unstructured data, and we set to work in London, in Washington, and a few other places to try and tease out of that data clues about who in fact are the ultimate beneficial owners of many of these companies. And we had about, we managed to identify in the data more than 100,000 entities. And I think we've identified more than 20,000 individuals behind them. It's slow work and it's detective work. After a year of this, another year of this, <coughs> so we're now like two years on, November last year, we ran the first phase of this operation. The Guardian newspaper in London, together with the BBC, who made a TV documentary, Panorama, Panorama documentary, and ICIJ, simultaneously produced a collaborative project, which we ran over several days, um, focusing on what we'd found out about the offshore industry and its secrets in England. Um, because it turned out that people from all over the world uh, were flocking to places like the BVI to buy offshore entities, which they were then using for buying property, 
doing transactions in the UK. So simply to focus on the UK connection was a year's worth of work. And as you can see, that is um, <coughs> another grab of one of the uh, stories that, that we launched. That exposure, the first phase, had several different focuses that we, we homed in on. And the first one was the British Virgin Islands because of all the offshore entities, it's the most successful and it's the one that's under the most control of the British government and it's the one that history is telling us is prone to the most obvious abuses right now. Um, when we published, it had a pretty strong political reaction. Uh, Sir Edward Clay, uh, who was a former British ambassador in, in Kenya, who's campaigned against corruption, said this, the cost and damage inflicted on other countries by our louche regime at home and abroad makes us, us vulnerable to charges of hypocrisy and worse. The us means, of course, uh, the British. Uh, this is Matthew Oakeshott, who is a uh, uh, a senior Lib Dem politician in the present coalition government in Britain, and he called the BVI, after these revelations, a stain on the face of Britain. He said, how can David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, keep a straight face calling for the G8 to make bi big business pay tax when we let the BVI use British law and British protection to suck in billions in dirty money? Uh, so these are, pretty, these are pretty pungent reactions, I think. Um, we didn't stop there. The second aspect that we focused on was the people who flooded into Britain, particularly into London, and bought up property, uh, particularly luxury property, uh, using anonymous offshore companies, mostly, again, from the BVI. And we produced an interactive map, which was quite hard work, where, I mean, I'm sorry that you can't see it on just this little <coughs> grab, screen grab, uh, but basically you could zoom in and you could click on all these places and up would come a little account of who actually owned the property in question. Um, just go back there. Why did everybody flood into London and buy the property using BVI companies? Well, we soon realized what Again, maybe well known to practitioners in the area, but as a civilian, startled me, uh, was that one reason was that you can get tax breaks if you set up an offshore company. Um, you don't pay any, well, it's sales tax. It's called stamp duty, uh, SDLT, stamp duty land tax. Uh, if you buy if you buy property in England, you have to pay something like 5% um, <coughs> on expensive property uh, as a tax. If, however, you transfer, you, you have it in the name of an offshore company, then you merely transfer the shares in the company. You don't sell the property. Uh, and if you have an offshore company that is managed or purports to be managed uh, offshore, uh, then you don't even pay the half a percent uh, stamp duty tax on share dealings in, in Britain. So if you just hand over the shares in the offshore entity, uh, you can make the sale completely tax-free, which is neat. Um, second big tax avoided is if you're a, you're a foreigner, you buy a property in London, there's not going to be any inheritance tax on it if it's held in the name of an offshore entity. If it's held in your own name, even if you're a foreigner, there's going to be inheritance tax to pay if you die. And the third, and often the most interesting tax trick, was that there is no capital gains tax, no profits tax, or if you sell a house at a profit, <coughs> if it's done offshore. And of course, these kind of tax breaks not only attracted uh, you know, Indians and Chinese and Russians and Ukrainians and Kazakhs to pour their money into London property. Um, it um, also attracted quite a lot of Britons, we found, uh, who were actually living in London into pretending that they were offshore and pretending that they um, had a company managed, managed offshore. 
the ways that you do that, as we discovered, involve nominee directors, and I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. Now, the result of offshore secrecy and all those tax breaks has been the London property boom. While there's been a recession in England, prices in London have roared upwards to the extent that nobody, nobody can live there, afford to live there. No young people can afford to buy houses anymore. Uh, but the market is being buoyed up by thousands of foreigners uh, taking advantage of these tax breaks. Um, the other consequence has been that I say, and Russians have come in, not just Russians, um, all kinds of post-Soviet billionaires, all kinds of Chinese billionaires, all kinds of Indian industrialists, all these people have flooded in. And there's another reason as well as the tax breaks while they do it. The secrecy enables them to conceal from their own citizens, their own tax authorities, how much wealth they've got and what they're doing with it. This is the sole purpose of offshore secrecy after all. Okay, so we did a lot of work on the offshore companies and we've named a lot of people and what they, what they own. Um, these are a few of the people that we identified uh, as owning BVI companies, people who were, were in London. And I think the lesson we took from it was that it's a system, well, to say it's wide open to abuse is to be kind. I mean, the system is designed for abuse. Uh, the only reason for having the level of purported absolute secrecy you have in a jurisdiction like the BVI is so it can be abused. It can be abused by people who've got things to hide. Uh, this, is, um, this is Mr. Achilles Kolakis, um, who's now doing seven years inside. Um, he um, persuaded uh, some banks, mainly the Anglo-Irish Bank and the Bank of Scotland, I think, to lend him more than a billion dollars um, to buy up property. And he did this by claiming that various BVI entities he'd set up and controlled were in fact stuffed with assets and were in fact backed by um, a secretive Chinese property magnate who we didn't want to mention. Uh, this was all backed up in fact by forged documents and it was all just a pack of lies. Um, there's a story about why the banks were so anxious to lend so much money to such an obvious crook. <laughs> and I say an obvious crook because you see that he was also known as, as Kalakis. He called himself Kalakis by the time he got arrested. The reason why was under his previous name, Kolakis, which isn't very different, um, he'd already been convicted of selling um, bogus lordships to rather credulous Americans. Uh, so, you know, here's a guy with a criminal record who's changed his name, who the banks uh, are in, in the British Isles have lent, have lent a billion dollars to. Um, it, 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 I marvel at what went on during the, the last bubble. Um, here's another one we found using BVI companies in London. Um, Mukhtar Ablyazov. Ablyazov. We don't know where he is at the moment. He was last seen uh, on a coach heading from England towards France through the Channel Tunnel. He is wanted in the UK for contempt of court because he won't, answer court, he won't obey court orders. Uh, the Kazakhstan authorities want him because they say he has looted $5 billion from the BTA bank there. So another successful banker. Uh, all done through BVI and Seychelles entities. Uh, got the money out of Kazakhstan into the classic offshore maze. Ah, now this one, Rinat Akhmetov. He's interesting. He is the richest man in the Ukraine. He also used a BVI company to buy what is believed to be the most expensive apartment in the whole of London. Um, and he bought it in the name of a BVI company called Water Property Holdings. Uh, that's in a block of apartments called Number One Hyde Park, which has the distinction that most of the flats there are owned by offshore companies, uh, a clear majority, mostly from the BVI, 
others from the Channel Isles or the Isle of Man. Um, so what you have in London is that property is being steadily taken over by secret companies, by secret owners. Here's another one we found, Vladimir Antonov. Uh, he's a football fan. He bought uh, Portsmouth Football Club in England. Uh, the Lithuanians now want him. They say he's uh, looted um, hundreds of millions of dollars from the Snorras Bank there. Um, so, BVI companies once again. His yacht is registered to a BVI company. He's taken good care to move his assets out using the BVI. Um, Scott Young. He's uh, not a Russian. He's, he's an English person. Or actually, he's a Scottish person. Uh, he's acquired 400 million pounds, uh, 600 million dollars or so, uh, working as a fixer for Boris Berezovsky and some other people as a property developer. Uh, Scott Young has a had a wife, Michelle, who you can see there um, next to him. Um, then he found a new friend. This is Scott Young and his new friend. Um, as a result of finding the new friend, there was a very uh, ugly divorce case uh, because Michel wanted a share of his assets. He declared that he was bankrupt. He hasn't got any money. He had 400 million pounds and it's mysteriously disappeared. It turns out he has been maneuvering using another maze of BVI companies uh, and some tame lawyers to um, hide his money. Uh, so that's another thing the BVI turned out to be being used for. Uh, okay. One of the key things that emerged from this series of disclosures uh, was not just that the BVI is used and abused by a succession of crooks, not to put too fine a word on it, um, but that there were elements in the company structures which are permitted in places like the BVI which made it possible for or made it easy for this kind of thing to happen. And one of them was sham directors. They call themselves nominee directors. Um, sham is the word we prefer. Um, we had a debate whether bogus was a better word, but w we settled on sham. Um, Sarah Petrimiers, who was our favorite person, um, we traveled all the way to the Caribbean to, uh, to track her down. Uh, you can see her there running a marathon. Um, she was born in the UK, in Bradford. She moved to the island of Sark, where she married, uh, she married someone from Sark, I think. Um, Sark is an amazing place. It's a little microscopic island in the Channel Isles. Uh, people know about Jersey, they know about Guernsey. Not quite so many people know about Sark. The Sarkies, in what used to be known as the Sark Lark, um, made a pretty good living out of various scams, uh, various company scams, and uh, providing nominee directors was one of them. There was a bit of a scandal about this in Britain around 1999, when one of the most prolific Sark fake directors, uh, Philip Crocher, I think who had something like 2,000 companies, was disqualified in the UK. Everybody then fled Sark and they moved, they scattered to, uh, well, she scattered to Nevis, uh, another place I didn't know too much about until I got into this. Um, but it, it sort of depends from St. Kitts. It's to the south of St. Kitts and... Um, it's sort of independent, I think. It's sort of autonomous from St. Kitts. Um, and it doesn't do very much or make very much apart from fake company activities. She moved to Nevis. A few others moved there. Another crowd of people from Sark moved to Dubai. Um, others went to Cyprus. I think there's a, there's a, a mob of um, fake directors in Vanuatu as well. Um, so the whole sham director industry suddenly swam into focus. Um, and th this is how we realized the trick worked. Um, some of you, many of you may know this is how the trick worked, but I didn't. I was startled about this. First of all, to be a sham nominee, 
You need an address in somewhere that's out of the jurisdiction, including out of the BVI jurisdiction, because you don't want to be liable in any way, in any reputable jurisdiction, for being a director. So they give addresses in Nevis, Dubai, Vanuatu, Mauritius, shady places like this. Secondly, you sign a nominee declaration. Uh, that's a quote from one of the documents we saw. I hereby declare I shall only act upon instruction from the beneficial owners, uh, which is scarcely uh, exercising independent judgment. And this one, absolutely key, the general power of attorney. attorney. Um, the nominee director signs that one, uh, on, and it gives the beneficial owner Total power, total control, control over the bank accounts, uh, which is crucial, uh, the power to do anything. It's uh, quite different from a specific power of attorney to you know, carry out some particular transaction or do something in a limited way. The general power of attorney is a complete abdication of any responsibility you've got as a, a director. And finally, um, routinely, the sham directors sign an undated resignation letter so that if there's any trouble, if there's any potential liability, uh, or if the beneficial owner doesn't care for them anymore, they can be resigned as of yesterday. Um, so we published as many names as we could find of, nominee, of fake nominee directors. <coughs> and I guess that publishing their names doesn't help their jobs because it doesn't really work if everybody can see you're a fake and you've got a thousand companies purportedly that are yours. We also did some simple work on the UK company registry. Um, this didn't involve any leaks, uh, but we were able to scrape that database and do some work which hadn't been done before to show that there were thousands and thousands of directors giving offshore addresses for not, not offshore entities, but UK companies. Um, and so there's a question mark over each of those about what is going on. And that was the statistics we came up with there. I think the Isle of Man tops that list, then Guernsey, Cyprus, although probably less so now, and Jersey. BVI is in the top group. Um, when we did this SARC, has got a high number, but it's all historic. Uh, they don't have many active companies because the whole Sark Lark has been exploded. But <laughs> 142,000 directorships in total um, of UK companies by people giving offshore addresses. That's pretty, pretty scary, I think, because I would, I would bet that a lot of those are simply not genuine in any uh, meaningful way. Okay. Spin on another year. Um, Gerard Ryle in Washington has now expanded this inquiry, this mining of our database, uh, much wider. It's now gone beyond the UK. He recruited um, 86 journalists in total. Um, <coughs> working in more than 40 countries to research the names that were coming up. And last month, another exercise in simultaneous publication, this time in a lot more countries all at once, and a lot more names. A lot more names of people using BVI companies to conceal what they were up to. Um, you can see that the Prime Minister of Georgia is one we, we made a headline about there, but there were a few more. And these are all just samples, you know. Uh, this is President Hollande's uh, uh, campaign treasurer, Jean-Jacques Augier. It turned out that he had a book distribution business he set up in China. Um, mysterious Chinese partner emerged who had 25% share in a BVI company behind it. Si Shu. Why did he want his uh, share kept quiet? Hmm, don't know. You could say uh, for legitimate reasons because it's so much easier to do things in the BVI than do things in China where it's very complicated and takes a long time. I've heard that said. I've heard it said at this conference. You can believe it if you like. Um, <laughs> the former finance minister of Mongolia 
Beot sucks Gadget. He's a very sad case. When we contacted him and said, look here, we found an, a, a, an offshore company uh, belonging to you in the BVI. He went to Washington, he flew to Washington and he banged on the door of the ICIJ and said, I know this is wrong, it's terrible, I shall have to go home and resign, but please, please don't publish it. Um, I'm afraid that's a request that fell on, on deaf ears uh, because publishing is what the ICIJ do. Um, President of Azerbaijan, uh, another one of the post-Soviet republics, um, and his daughters, company set up in the name of his daughters, uh, is set up by a local construction magnate, Hassan Ghazal. Why is he giving a share to the president's daughters? I can't think. Um, and Russia's deputy prime minister, Igor Shuvalov, his wife turned out to have a, an offshore company in the BVI. Um, he said, there wasn't anything wrong about it. She said there wasn't anything wrong about it. Um, a lot of people in Russia think there's nothing wrong at all in having um, BVI companies. So maybe, you know, maybe that's genuine too. Here's a few more. Um, Tony Merchant, husband of a senator in Canada. He had $800,000 that he put into an offshore trust. Um, the correspondence there was kind of illuminating because he insisted on paying the registration fees in cash and he said that their all written communications should be kept to a minimum. I wonder why. Um, daughter of the notorious President Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines, she turned out to have an offshore company in the BVI. Um, I don't know how things are in the, in the Philippines, even though Marcos was such a notorious dictator and a looter, it seems that his daughter is now a provincial governor and doing fine. So, you know, I don't actually understand the politics of the Philippines, but um, they've been illuminated a touch by um, the, the existence of his daughter's company. In Spain, we found uh, Baroness Carmen Thyssen Bornemitza um, is buying lots of art using offshore entities. Uh, she told us it was sort of more convenient to move it around that way. I believe her. Of course. Um, and in America, uh, here, there have been quite a few that have been outed who are using offshore trusts for a variety of reasons. One of the most prominent, Denise Rich there, was the wife of Mark Rich, the oil trader, who was pardoned by President Clinton at, shortly before he stepped down. Um, the data there shows her putting $144 million into a trust. Cook Islands Trust called the Dry Trust. I think Jack Blum talked here about these, these trusts like the ones they have in the Cook Island. They're not trusts as you and I thought we knew them, you know, because you don't hand over the money uh, and control of the money to other people. Um, you appear to magically keep control of it yourself. Um, so, very innovative. Okay, um, so that's how far we've got so far with mining this database. And the ICIJ as a result, it's had worldwide publicity. Um, I think there have now been literally several thousand articles written about this, and everyone rehearses the names of the people who've got these companies. And I imagine that's quite damaging, quite damaging to confidence that if you're a rich person, your name can be kept quiet. Um, is there going to be more? Uh, there is definitely going to be more. Um, we haven't finished mining this database yet. And as I said, it's a complicated process of teasing out clues. Um, I think there's going to be another six to eight months work on teasing out a lot more names, especially in the Far East, in Asia. I think there's maybe another 20,000 names we could find if we worked at it, and some of those are going to be people who will be sorely embarrassed. Because um, what's come out is that <laughs> people really didn't like to have their names exposed. Uh, you know, their reactions have been have ranged from bluster to denial to remorse. Um, but, you know, perhaps we should be asking ourselves whether this is a structure that can survive under these circumstances when, if you're going to run a business like this, providing secret entities for people, 
then it's going to have to be computerized, obviously. You're going to have to have databases. And they are going to leak. Uh, sure as anything, they're going to leak. Um, there's been a political reaction, of course, in Europe uh, about this flood of disclosures. This is the British Chancellor, George Osborne, recently said that they're going to do something about this. They're going to have tax exchange agreements um, with the Caribbean countries. Uh, and, of course, the, the upcoming G8, uh, Britain is going to take a big stand, they say, against tax evasion and against these opaque offshore entities. Um, I don't know whether that is really enough um, because obviously there is going to be pushback <coughs> from places like the BVI and the infrastructure of accountants, lawyers, investment managers, all the people who, for whom this kind of secrecy structure works. Um, so we'll see. Um, I've got my own opinions about what reforms would be useful. And I'd be interested to know whether you think that th these are achievable um, as well as desirable. I don't see why there shouldn't be a public database of BVI company directors. And I certainly don't see why there shouldn't be a public database of BVI company beneficial owners. Um, I have to admit that when you get into the UK company registry, which on the face of it is perfectly transparent, it turns out that actually it's just as easy to conceal the names of the beneficial owners there. Um, and so maybe we need to do some reforms about that. Um, I was looking at a company last month called Growlux, G-R-O-L-U-X. Um, and um, the shareholders on the face of it were a couple of British bankers, uh, Catholic bankers, John Varley and Peter Sutherland. Um, that's right. And it turned out they were acting as nominees for unknown parties. And there's nothing in British company law which apparently requires their identities to be revealed of the ultimate beneficial owner. I found out who the ultimate beneficial owner was. It was the Pope. Uh, <laughs> It turned out that they are fronting for the Vatican and that this company owns a lot of expensive property in central London, like the Bulgari, the upmarket jewellers, their premises, for example. Um, and it's all a rather shadowy process of investing a lot of money that was given to the Pope by Mussolini in 1929. Uh, they did a deal under which, the Lateran Treaty under which... Uh, Basically, they recognized each other, uh, and to sweeten the deal, Mussolini gave the Pope a lot of money, uh, which was funneled through Switzerland and Luxembourg, uh, and ended up you know, buying a lot of obscure property in the UK. So we need some reforms in the UK as well. And another reform which I would like to see very much is that the British Land Registry should also have a public database of beneficial owners, because... It's supposed to be a transparent register at the moment, and what happens is it is steadily becoming more and more meaningless um, as more and more properties are held in the name of obscure offshore entities, frequently in the BVI. Um, so whether that's a feasible program for reform, I don't know. But if we did all those things, it would probably finish off the trade in uh, sham nominee directors because one of the reasons they can get away with it is nobody can see how many heterogeneous companies uh, they're purporting to be directors of. And I think it would make it a good deal more difficult for people like Russian oligarchs to loot their own countries and move the proceeds out uh, using the facilities provided by what is still a British overseas territory. And I'm really with um, Matthew Oakeshott, the Lib Dem politician on this. I think it is a stain on the face of Britain that this stuff goes on. And so I personally very much hope that this process of disclosure is going to strip away this anonymity and it is going to uh, damage, if not destroy, the confidence of rich people that they can hide their wealth. Um, I should stop there, really, and, and see if there's any... Any questions?
or observations. Yeah. Is there a mic somewhere? Yeah. Hi, Martin Kenny from the BVI. Um, uh, although I'm from the BVI, I'm also a fraud to recovery lawyer. Um, I think that some of your premises are overstated or false, but uh, one thing about your suggestions for reform uh, might be that as a fraud lawyer, I would say that the um, characters on the other side are always one step ahead of any reform. Uh, so for instance, now we have an array of nominee UBOs. Now, 10 years ago, uh, many of us didn't know what a UBO was. Um, I'm not quite sure it existed then in terms of an acronym. Um, certainly, 20 years ago, it did not. Uh, now, so we have, uh, and that the whole concept of UBO was to defeat the notion that nominee shareholders could conceal the identities of the true owner and that uh, the global standard to, to combat money laundering as posited by the FATF on money laundering established by the Group of Seven in 1989 uh, was to cause there to be collected objective data of the identity of the true owners of these vehicles. Fair enough. Uh, but when we go with disclosure orders sometimes, um, we find that uh, there are another s series of uh, nominee pretend UBOs that we then have to cut through. So I just offer the view that your reform won't work in the, in the area of combating fraud because all that will happen is that there will be a series of nominal uh, UBOs put on the registry in cases where people want to conceal who they might be behind them. So I, I think reform uh, is, t is going to be tougher than simply having another layer of disclosure. Uh, it's not going to stop fraud, it won't stop corruption, bad behavior will continue. Um, I also think that um, uh, the, 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 the uh, speedy conclusion that the BVI is a secrecy jurisdiction is, 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 is falsely predicated. Uh, we have no secrecy law. Uh, we have no unfortunate statute like Switzerland has criminalizing uh, investigations regarding protected data. Uh, all we have is the common law rule that says that uh, a, a customer of a bank or of a trust company can rely on a common law duty of confidence uh, that confidential information will be kept protected and that the only remedy there is in our law is not no people can't go to jail for violating that duty all they can have to do is pay some compensation if they wrongly disclose someone's confidences so to uh, you have to be careful with your language when you when you accuse a small jurisdiction of wrongdoing or using secrecy law to protect uh, secrets uh, when in fact that's not true in terms of what the legal uh, infrastructure is in the jurisdiction so I'm suggesting yeah well we're talking about uh, we, we, we're talking about we're using the term in different senses I don't mean a secrecy jurisdiction in the, the sort of Swiss sense that they say you go to jail if you reveal the secrets I mean a secrecy jurisdiction in the sense that uh, the BVI Financial Services Commission uh, does not require the publication of information about the owners or the directors, but no, never mind the accounts of uh, the entities, the IPCs that, 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 that are set up. Furthermore, the BVI Financial Services Commission has no idea who the owners of these companies are. Uh, the only information that is published is the identity of the agent. Um, the FSC may well say if there's clear evidence of wrongdoing, they will go to the agent and ask them who the owners are. As often as not, and this was one of the things that startled me when we got all this data, the agent themselves in the BVI has absolutely no idea who the UBO is, the purported UBO is, and they say, oh, well, this is all, we've sold the company via an introducer um, in a third country, you know, and, and we, we didn't need to know any of due diligence from them because they're like regulated in the home country. So here you've got layer after layer of willful ignorance.
Let me, can I ask you a question? Um, the rumor on the street is that the ICIJ is going to drip feed this information out into the public for whatever reason. If you guys were serious about exposing fraud and about exposing the UBOs, why wouldn't you publish this information right now in Toto so that those of us who need that information to go after fraudsters could use it and perhaps put money back into the, into the pockets of victims? Well, it's been a problem. Ever since the ICIJ started to publish this stuff, uh, they've been deluged in Washington with people saying, just what you've said, why don't you publish all the information so we can see and we can make use of it um, for our own purposes or to prevent fraud? Um, and the answer is, first of all, the ICIJ has not finished doing the journalistic work on it. Uh, as I said, there's another six months' work at least. Uh, secondly, it's not like a treasure chest. You can't open it and the names fall out. There are clues in this data. Uh, I've just explained how very often, you know, the name of the beneficial owner doesn't just appear, and certainly the nature of their transactions. You have to mine your way through this data and be detectives, be journalists. Well, that's so, what we do. We're asset sure. recovery lawyers, so we could take that same data, that same data, and do the same thing you're doing. My, 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 why wait six months when there are those of us who could actually do our own data mining out of that and hopefully help people before, for example, statute of limitations expire, assets get moved to another jurisdiction? Why, the, why is this information being parceled out so slowly? Well, the ICIJ, which is a fairly small outfit, is working on it as fast as it can and it is publishing as soon as it gets anything coherent that it can publish. So, you know, they're working as hard as they can. There's no intent to conceal it, but on the other hand, this is the, this is the ICIJ's stock in trade. This is their shtick, you know, that they are, going, they are going to expose these names and publish them as much as they can. At the end of this process, it's hoped that the ICIJ will start to publish raw data as much as it can, yes, but that moment has not yet come. But uh, David, couldn't one reason be that, you know, there are plenty of, you know, let's call them innocent uh, names uh, on that database. So, uh, you know, I would say the difference between the ICIJ and WikiLeaks, for example, is that sort of WikiLeaks, you know, is irresponsible in my opinion, it just publishes everything. The ICIJ seems to be you know, looking for stories as much as anything and may even recognize that, you know, it's unfair to just publish all of the information. Well, I'm really glad you've made that point and I should have made it myself. Uh, the crucial thing that the ICIJ is doing, and because it is possible that there are innocent explanations or that people are doing legitimate things, every name that they publish, they're tracking down that person and going to them and saying, what have you got to say about this? We're trying to do the responsible journalistic thing. Just dumping it out raw like WikiLeaks is not what we want to do and not what it would be right to do. So if you realize that you have to trace each person and put it to them, you realize it's a slow process. David, um, my name's Burke. I'm a financial investigator and I applaud what you're doing with respect to corruption and fraud. Um, Martin was very kind in saying some of your conclusions are overreach. I think they're very dangerous overreach. I have no problem with the privacy or secrecy jurisdiction whatsoever, whether it be offshore or in the United States, provided that it has nothing to do with corruption or fraud. I've seen many people in Latin America in particular that are working very hard to pre pretend to be managers of their business and not be owners and be subject to extortion or kidnapping. There are different places and different times where secrecy and privacy are very important to the safety of the people. And the information at the ICIJ is very powerful, very powerful. Please, please, please be careful on how it is wielded. Please. Well, that's a good point. There are, we, it's been put to us that quite a lot of people in Russia, for example, uh, are in danger if it becomes known that they have assets abroad. And it, it gets quite complicated. On the one hand, you can sympathize with people who are in a jurisdiction where there's, there's a very shaky rule of law and there's a sort of mafia uh, amb ambience. On the other hand, secrecy always breeds fraud and secrecy enables people to, to steal and loot as well as to operate in, 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 with a modicum of safety. So, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I always come down on the side of transparency uh, with a measure of responsibility. Well, no, but this isn't about bedrooms. This is about money. <laughs> well, 
Well, how can you tell whether they've done nothing wrong until you examine the, the data? I don't believe that there's any good reason to keep the beneficial ownership of an entity secret. There may be occasional special cases where I could be persuaded uh, that there was a good reason for secrecy, but mainly there are bad reasons for secrecy. And the fact is, the BVI uh, survives and avoids the need for subsidy from the British government by the revenues it gets from selling a shady, uh, a shady thing. Uh, well, uh, there's a close relationship between human dignity and privacy rights, I would offer. Like you don't want the state with its camera in your bedroom, you don't want the state in your private banking affairs unless you've done something wrong. And I don't think it's right for a journalist to suggest that we can presuppose people have done something wrong and therefore we should have no secrecy. Well, I think secrecy is always a red flag. It's a different view about rights. Yes. There's somebody over that, in that direction. Uh, but the question I've got, uh, I'm, uh, my name is Dan Wise, I'm also a fraud lawyer acting uh, to recover money. Uh, in our work, we often get disclosure orders, so there's absolutely no absolute secrecy about um, company information in the BVI. Um, but the point I've got is, in this enormous amount of data, you're clearly going to look at people, um, and I can see there's an arguable public interest in the examples you've given. Um, what gives your, or the organization, the ICIJ, to look at the, uh, the locus, the moral locus, to go through the information of people in whom there's no public interest? And you, presumably you have to look at all of them. So you'll be looking at a lot of people for whom there's no public interest. Now, whether you publish that or not uh, doesn't seem to me to um, avoid questions about whether or not the 86 journalists are entitled to look at that information any more than I think I would be entitled to look at your medical records or your, your private banking information. And I just wonder how you address that. Well, I'm not concerned with abstract questions of philosophy. It's an obvious public good that this information uh, be made public in cases where it is in the public interest to do so. The fact that we've, is that we've been quite responsible in not publishing the identities of people who haven't done anything wrong on examination. So we've confined ourselves to publishing uh, information that's, that's relevant and that's in the public interest. I should add that there is a growing trend for the tax authorities of various uh, Western countries to pay uh, the kind of people who purloin this information large sums of money uh, in return for them handing it over. Now, would you say that that's wrong as well? Well, it's going to be very interesting to see where the prosecutions based on that information in England are going to be sustainable because um, effectively the revenue, certainly arguably, has um, received stolen goods and whether that's admissible in the English court, I, I don't know the answer to yet, I but I don't think it's been litigated yet. Um, but I mean, I mean, I just don't see, uh, out of nosiness, whether I should be allowed to intercept your post. Well, as I say, these are abstract philosophical points you're making. In the real world, people steal money, people loot money, people try and cheat their creditors, try and cheat their ex-wives, uh, and they then get lawyers and accountants and other practitioners who make a pretty penny out of, uh, I think the phrase used there is something was willful blindness. Um. I'm Alison Armstrong, I'm from Canada, I'm a journalist, and I, I've, we've heard that there's no question there's corruption going on and the, uh, and the dump has uncovered a great deal of it. There's been a lot of strong language used on both sides of the pond about this, and I'm just wondering if, for instance, in the UK, fraud squads are being beefed up as a result of this, because the politicians seem to be intent on trying to do something about it, or at least say they are. Uh, in Canada so far, um, our federal government, I think, wants to see the contents of what the CBC is currently working on because they've never, to the CBC's knowledge, prosecuted a case of offshore crime uh, in our country. However, they all the time go after small, low-hanging fruit like carpenters and factory workers and so on, and small businesses and doctors sometimes. So I'm just curious to know if you think anything will really come of this in terms of action in the UK. I'm hoping something will in Canada, but not so far. I think the political atmosphere in the UK has altered. There has been a bit of a turning of the tide. We've been campaigning about 
tax evasion, not just this BVI stuff with rich individuals, but corporate tax evasion on a grand scale for several years now. And as the country stumbles into in recession uh, and inequality rises, people get more resentful and bitter. And one of the targets of their resentment and bitterness is the rich guys getting away with not paying any tax. So I, I've been surprised at how much this theme has been picked up by people and that when we publish this kind of thing, it gets an instant political response and people start promising to do things about it. I mean, whether they will, who knows? David? First of all, I think there's a very plausible argument that with the passage of time, this data will become useless. Yeah. Um, and so I think to my colleague's concern, and Davis' concern, six months is a long time in the world of fraud. By that time, based on the published reports dating back to November of 2012, this money's long gone. And to the extent that we have any opportunity to capitalize on the data to shut down fraudsters' activities, I'd argue that as of today, done. But to the extent that there might be some lingering naive fraudster out there, which is a bit of an oxymoron, uh, that still has his money in these accounts, and to the extent that you have stated two sort of global purposes for the use of this data, one more political and hoping that the governments now step up to the game and say, or step up to the plate and, and, say that, and actually follow through and wanting to do something about tax avoidance schemes, but there's this other side, which is also the individual fraudster and the asset protectioners that are using this for that purpose. If we're going to get at them and you're true to your word that you want to help get at them, why wouldn't we have some type of consortium with fraud chasing attorneys, several of which are in this room, where we can get access to the database where it's not publicly available, but if we have, for instance, even a known case filed where we're actively pursuing a fraudster and we run keyword searches through the database. And I want to just emphasize one point on the keyword searches. You say the struggles and the lack of resources that the consortium has relative to getting through this data. This is stuff we do all the time. One, you know, 250 gigabytes of data, I'll have that done in less than a week. And you're going to take six months. We simply don't have that kind of time. So if you're true to your word, let's come up with some type of resolution or reconciliation of what you want and what we want, and let's work together and get it done. Well, it's an interesting point you raise, and I'll go and talk to Gerald Ryle in Washington, who is basically the, the man who controls this data, and, and tell him what you said. And um, maybe we, there is something that can be worked out to do this. But you've got to bear in mind that we've got different agendas. Your agenda is you want to do something about individual fraudsters, uh, by the sound of it. Our agenda as journalists is we want to add to the stock of public information. We want to tell people what's going on. And some of that is historical. We don't mind it being historical. Uh, we want to use this material to lay out to people the way the world really is. And then people can decide if they want to do something about it. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to say, I mean, Neil... Uh you know, you want the information, right? So you can make money off it. I mean, you're not working for free for, you know, victims. You know. <laughs> well, well, and what's wrong with him being a journalist? You know, he's a journalist. Yeah. He's not here to help you make money. He's here to do his job according to his uh, uh, ethics, his principles. Uh, he's doing it much more professionally than WikiLeaks, which is just, you know, publish everything. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's to be uh, commended. It's the fundamental difference between, uh, you know, uh, uh, a professional journalist and, and some Mickey Mouse organization like uh, WikiLeaks. I have a comment and an observation slash question in the back. I am from the BVI and I've noted comments from esteemed presenters as well as some of the t attendees here today and noting the importance of confidentiality and Mr. Lee you've cited the BVI as a secrecy jurisdiction and couched your premise on the BVI model. The BVI model works and it has been tested, retested and tested again and I find it very interesting from the publications that there has been no mention of the reviews by FATF style regional bodies by the IMF, by the Foot Report, and the international cooperation that the BVI has successfully engaged in with the UK government, the US government. And so on the statement of facts where you have been cautioned in terms of 
just ca casually referring to the BVI as a secrecy jurisdiction. I think it is dangerous. You've also heard comments in terms of confidentiality and the concerns to the innocent persons who actually use BVI structures legally. Um, there's been no discussion about that, and it seems to be that you are, you are uh, biased in your approach from my review. Some of the comments that have been made um, are seeking to tweeze out the fullness of the discussion and in terms of what you found because many of the asset recoverers and the regulators are all against corruption and fraud and wrongdoing and criminal activity but that has not necessarily been borne out. So I would like to hear your comments in terms of presenting the fuller picture of the BVI in your future uh, exposing of these data leaks. Well, I think we presented. <laughs> well, I would just say that I think the ICIJ has presented the fullest picture so far of what really goes on in the BVI. What, um, David, uh, the, the, David the, the, just to respond to David's point, though, and to pick up on Neil's, I tend to agree with you more than I disagree with you, but the point here is that if I was cynical and I thought that you were, you were, this information was being dripped out into the public in, in the small pieces, you could, you could come to the conclusion that ICIJ is doing it to draw attention to itself and to, and to publish newspapers. And, and I think Neil proposed a very uh, realistic approach which is is there a way that a consortium can be set up to allow certain people to come in and look at that information because we are as David says we are making money absolutely We're not, no one's apologetic about that at all we're not in it's not, it's you may not be in this if, with this but but the asset recovery lawyers are but in the process they're vindicating victim rights and that's the real important issue yes we're making money at it um, but but victims need access to that information so uh, all I say is that I would not reject that out of hand and I certainly think you should try to advocate for access, limited perhaps, access to that information so that we can see if there's information that might otherwise become stale. Well, I'll go and talk about this. I think maybe there is, from what you say, scope for some kind of consultancy. Maybe ICIJ should set up a consultancy arm um, and, uh, you know, s sell you the information. How about that? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm from the BVI as well, and um, I just wanted to comment on something you just said. You said you've made a fullest disclosure. Um, I don't agree with that because I think you focused on publishing the sensational stories. You focused on publishing um, information about uh, Ferdinand Marcos's daughter and the Canadian minister's husband and the French minister and all of these people. But you have a huge database with many names which you um, are keeping secret for the next six months. And I think it would be far more useful if you would um, uh, turn that information over to the, to the regulators, the BVI Financial Services Commission, to start with, because there may be names on there that don't trigger any, um, anything in, in your mind, but um, people that we would be interested in, in investigating, other regulators may be interested in investigating as well. And I, I think that would be a far more useful um, you know, use of the information you've collected. Well, let me make it plain once again. What we do as journalists is publish, and we publish as much as we can. And what we've set out to do is not, I mean, I've, I've said a few things about my personal opinions about what should be done this afternoon, but what the ICIJ is doing is an exercise that's more neutral. We're saying, here are the identities of these people who, have, uh, who are the beneficial owners of BVI companies. Make of it what you will. And if people then come to the conclusion that this is a bad thing, then they can do something about it. If they come to the conclusion that it's all fine, then fine, you know. I mean, I think what we rest on is, is, is a journalistic principle. We are making the information public so people can take a view about it. I, uh, in, in your words, it seemed that everything that was from offshore was bad. And that would mean if I were to purchase a London flat with a Delaware corporation that would be bad. Of course I don't even think I could purchase the front door on a London flat. <laughs> but let's, let's turn the construct around. You know, in, in a way yours is a protest uh, over against secrecy, tax evasion and fraud and I fully champion all of those. But is not offshore 
a very quiet protest of the productive part of society against those nations that have overtaxed and overregulated their citizens to the point of insanity? I, I ask that not looking for an answer, but for a thought process to why offshore exists and why it's flourishing and continues to flourish in very authentic and reasonable ways, excluding fraud and corruption. Well, well you know, that's a very interesting comment, and I'm sure that lots of people in this room would agree with you. <laughs> and, I, and I think in addition, I think we can keep it short. I would like to know what your opinion is actually for going offshore in general. Well, going offshore as such is okay. You know, there are obviously occasions when, if you're running some funds, uh, you, nobody wants to be taxed twice unnecessarily. So this is why I haven't focused my remarks on tax havens as such, but just on secrecy jurisdictions. And an offshore jurisdiction that's fairly transparent doesn't bother me. Um, that's why I think the work to be done is to open up the secrecy jurisdictions. Um. I've been handed a, uh, a, a question to pose from another member of the audience. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure why, but, but in any event, uh, the question is, uh, how did you get this information? Did you get it lawfully, or is it, was it stolen? Well, yeah, you don't expect me to tell you. I thought you were into transparency, openness, and accuracy. Well, you will know that journalists always protect their sources. Um, I must also tell you that Gerard Ryle, who brought this hard drive to the ICIJ, has never told me the name of the source. So I don't know it. Um, he keeps it confidential because it's his source. I guess if you had purloined this information, and I guess it was purloined, that you wouldn't greatly want your name to be made public because you might get into serious trouble. So that is why the source would want to have their identity kept secret. And how does it help you to know where it came from? Uh, what I can tell you that's useful <clears throat> is that it does come from the internal files of various incorporation agencies. And the other thing I can tell you is it is absolutely certain that all this information is completely authentic. Yeah. I, I've actually seen a, a video, Martin, um, uh, an interview of Gerard, uh, who I actually spoke with uh, a few weeks ago. I was trying to get him to co-present with David. Uh, and in the video, um, uh, he states that uh, a package just arrived at his office, which, you know, I know as a journalist, that does happen. You know, people send you information anonymously, and he, he, he either overtly stated, or stated it or it was implied from the interview that he really didn't know uh, the source uh, of the information. It arrived at his office you know, in the, uh, you know, proverbial plain brown envelope. Yeah, but the thing I was trying to get across uh, at the outset of this, this conversation was that when you have this kind of database being constructed and coming into existence, it will leak. And that's why the, the, the thing that WikiLeaks started is what we're going to see more of. And that's why I think information of this kind is no longer safe. In, in, the, in the world of the internet, the stuff, it's too easy to leak. Uh, and it's, you can leak it in enormous quantities. In the past, you know, a journalist would get brought a document in an envelope. Now they get brought a hard drive that's smaller than what you would put in an envelope and contains enough material that a fleet of trucks would be needed to bring the paper if it was written down on paper. So the game has changed. Well, that's true too. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Jason. I'm just, uh, I'm